isn't the best use for this 500 contiguous acres. 500 contiguous acres isn't easy to come across in the suburbs nowadays. I don't, I don't think you need to prove that. I think that's pretty much accepted. Um, so people got together and um, convinced the township that they needed to do a community process. They needed to bring people together in the community and talk about this land and get a feel for the way that people in the community thought this land should be used. That process became known as the master plan process. And it was um, organized, moderated by a group called WRT, Wallace Robertson Todd, who are professional landscape architects and community planners. There were a series of five public meetings there were a series of public meetings in which people were asked to come and discuss openly um, how they thought the land should be used, and they were asked to fill in surveys and put dots next to uh, write-ups about different activities that could take place on the park. And out of that process evolved the concept that a, a large portion of the community wanted to see a good deal of the park used for conservation and preservation. And then that concept was taken one step further, and 26% of the land was dedicated to active recreation area. And that's 14, I'm sorry, my math is bad. And it's 86, the other way, right? 14, my math is bad. 14% in the northern portion of the park. That's on the top left-hand side of this map. It's where, if you've ever been there, the barns are located. And the remainder of the property is to be dedicated primarily to conservation and preservation and habitat restoration. Um, that includes keeping um, bicycle access and automobile access to the outskirts of the park and attempting to make all of the internal access to the park foot traffic oriented. Um, so let me collect my thoughts. That, now, one of the things that's a little odd about the master planning process is it was done, you know, I don't want to use the word vacuum, but it was done as just a park planning process. It was not, in fact, done as part of a larger community plan, not, not for a specific reason. That's just the way things worked out. One of the odd things that emerged out of that is Boyce Mayview, this piece of property became a target for almost anything anybody in the community wanted to resolve that they needed a piece of land to do it. That's still a conflict in this community, and it's still one we need to work as a community to deal with. And one of the things I think we need to recognize is the uniqueness of this piece of property. You cannot find another contiguous five acres in the community, probably not in the region. So it's one of the few spaces that can provide these unique opportunities to do conservation and preservation. And I'm not saying that other activities that people in the community deem important that require property are non-essential or unimportant. That's not my point. I just think we need to work as a community to find locations to satisfy all those needs. So we need to kind of take this planning process even a little wider as, as time goes on. I hope to see us get a bigger view and start doing plans for the community sidewalk plans that help connect all of these places together where all of these activities can take place. And we're not there yet, but the second step in the park planning process is the, is the process called the pre-schematic. Someone explained to me that the master plan is um, like the star's eye view. I mean, you are looking at the park from way, 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 way up there. And you're just saying we're going to basically what you got out of it was we're going to set aside 14% for active and 86% for passive. I'm, I'm, I'm being, uh, that's not all we got out of it by any means. There was more detail than that, but that was one of the great big concepts. And, and everything that came out of it was kind of great big concepts. The pre-schematic process is the next phase. And they tell me that that's bird's eye view. 
you're not going to get a map of trails. You're not going to get a layout of um, where the bicycle trail is and the arc trail. We're not going to get down to the detailed level. That needs to be done on a project by project basis. But the pre-schematic is going to bring us closer. One of the things the pre-schematic would concentrate on is the footprint in the northern area of the park, um, how to, and there are, there's talk about a swimming pool there. There's talk about, what are the, what are the, community commons, community center. There's much work going on in the REC. Now, there, all of these other projects are still in their infancy phase, but there's actually work being done on the EEC, which will be on the southern end of the northern part of the property. Um, so that's the, the Wallace WRT, the same people who did the master plan, are in the process of putting together the pre-schematic. Um, it's currently on hold, but one of the things I'd like to quit talking now and ask you guys, understanding that a pre-schematic is a little bit of detail about what kind of things would you like to see in the park, what kind of habitat preservation areas should we have, where should we, should we be dealing in forests, should we be dealing in meadows, how do we incorporate Chartier's Creek into the bigger picture of the park and make use of that, the, the water and the floodplain. So I'd like to open the floor if anyone would like to talk about ideas they have for specific activities and non-activities they'd like to see take place. If you want to do that, uh, we'll be glad to take you out. Does that sound like fun? There's wildlife, there's some other things we can do to do all that. Uh, there's the, that's, that's the most developed section of the park. And as you move over, the Environmental Education Center will be up in this area. And you keep moving around. Uh, Baker School's up on the hill up here. You see, I had a pointer to try to do this. Uh, up on the hill here, that's, that's the school. Um, keep coming around, and at this juncture here at the thin part, uh, some people call that the hinge. That's where the uh, police training facility is. Anybody ever seen that? It's actually off limits, but uh, you can see it. It's right down in the floodplain. And then you just keep coming around onto the this is the boy section of the park. You get to that from Morton Road, right? That's where the community gardens are, uh, up on the hill. The tower, people familiar with the tower, the big tower, you can really see the park from there. And uh, obviously here, that Chartier's Creek runs along the whole border of the park. And anything probably from here down is you know, pretty steep slope. Most of these areas here and over here are, are, for the most part, open fields. So that's it. Can you point out where ALT is? Uh, ALT is actually uh, up here at the top of the map. Uh, right? No. Yeah. Uh, 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 right over there. Right, 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 right here. Yeah. Even our, <laughs> even our two tallest guys with pens. Yeah, well, it, it, is off, it is off the map, but uh, it, it is, aside from Mayview Road, which runs along here, it's, uh, the property's a, all but a butt. They're literally yeah. across the street yeah. from one another. You see the little blue yeah. spaces up yeah. top? Yeah, this is the, I, okay. this is the road. Can I ask a question? How many people participated in the master planning process? Oh, a whole bunch. Good. So one of the things I didn't say was, you know, WRT really opened my eyes. Do you, how can, 
can, they, they did all of these surveys. They came back with surveys about where the land was steep and where the land was flat and where the habitat was very diverse and where the habitat was dis not destructed but impacted. And so they had all of these wonderful criteria that they went out and did studies across the whole scope of the property and then they would mentally and physically kind of overlay these characteristics to tell you where in the park it was a good place to do preservation and conservation, where in the park it was already fairly impacted. So you might not be, you wouldn't be doing as much damage by making that a more active area of the park. It was a really interesting process and I, uh, I gained a lot of understanding about the property. And I just want to make clear that they, didn't, they don't come in and kind of draw a grid and go, okay, we're going to put the playground here and the swimming pool here. They really did a lot of research to determine the impact on the land making those decisions. Tracy. And I just wanted to add a little bit more detail um, for the young folks. When she talked about a lot of studies, you can sort of think of it as a layer cake. They came in, they did hydrologic studies, geologic studies, soils analysis, the angle of the sun and wind, cardinal directions, steepness of slopes, waterways, wetlands, uplands, woodlands, meadows, interface areas, ecotones, all the zones that make this one of the most diverse areas locally that is still intact. And so these are the things that people have been using the land well for approximately 7,000 years. And the waterway is one of the key connectors. It's uh, transportation, transportation, hunting, um, growing uh, crops, early uses of the land. Then in came the settlers and we began to have timbering, agriculture, mining, the state hospital use, and then most lately, and still you have transportation connections, connections to what's happening there, the rest of the community, within the smaller segments of the environmental, um, the ecologic zones within that park. This is open space, and how, how do you think of open, open space is what it consists of and how we use it and how we relate to it and our impact on it and its impact on us. So these are all the things that we see when we walk onto this land. Instead of just seeing a tree, we see a tree related how? How does it relate to other trees? How is it related to the most current uh, utilization of most of the land in Upper St. Clair is what? Do you know? I, I know you know, but can you put your finger on it right away? Residential. Residential and development. So this, these are huge things, and as you look at this, 500 acres of contiguous property. It doesn't sit alone. Look at Chartier's Creek all the way down. You're part of the Ohio Basin. Chartier's Creek is a watershed, big watershed. This is one of the properties right on a horseshoe area of it. So what's going up and down that river? Is it pollution? Is it clean water? Is it fish? Is it dead water? Is it mining residue? What does it all have to do? And these are all the things that you can see when you walk out on that land, when you start looking at the little details. And when WRC was here, those were the things that they were looking at. It just wasn't a piece of empty space. It was open space filled with many, many meanings and many importances that we as humans and nature interact inter inter <laughs> inter inter interact with, there's that word. <laughs> so. Um, I think that's one of the exciting things about it. So this, um, this plan that we have, this great community process that Jan and Jeff have been talking about, were things that brought everybody together, hopefully beginning to see these little things that make this so very, very important. So it's open space. How does open space relate to a very highly uh, developed community and region? That's the fun of uh, seeing how open space relates from a planning standpoint, uh, learning standpoint, enjoyment standpoint.
80s when they did the building where, do all of you know where Boyce Road crosses Chartier's Creek? Okay, there's a office building right there. That was excavated at that time. That was found to be a, I believe, Monyak is the, Monongahela Yakagami. Um, man, it goes back to the Middle Woodlands, and that is approximately, or if I can remember, around 700 AD, uh, maybe even earlier. That's one um, analyzed site. There are numerous sites like that up and down. Um, some of the sites are not for public dissemination, but it was a lot of hunting, gathering, um, farming. Uh, they raised various crops. Um, how, there was a settlement pattern. There actually were the, everything that goes with living, waste, home sites, fire pits. So it, it has a very relevant archaeological record. So um, one picture I had of, of a subject that was supposed to happen tonight was uh, fields and field management. Uh, this is a picture of one of the inner fields that, uh, on the Mayview side. If you've been over there lately, it looks a little different now because it hasn't been cut for a couple of years. And I don't have a picture of that, but it's grown up quite a lot rather than just grass, as you've seen a lot of other stuff over there. Herbs, uh, milkweed, goldenrod, uh, you know, really perennial stuff. And, um, you know, the question we were going to hopefully, or get some questions answered tonight about you have you have a resource like this. What do you what do you do to manage it, and what are you managing it for? In other words, what's going to live there, and how are we going to uh, interact with that? So, as Jan mentioned about the the master plan and the pre schematic, some of these areas need to be uh, designated for certain uses. In other words, are we going to keep this as a field, or do we want this to just be left alone and grow back to forest? You know, that's one question. Uh, if we do want it as a field, what are we managing it for? What kind of uh, animals are we going to encourage to live there? If we, if we keep it short like that, that's going to encourage a certain group of animals. If we leave it grow up further, it's uh, going to encourage a different group. And uh, <clears throat> one group would be birds. You know, birds are pretty uh, keyed in. Uh, certain group of birds are really keyed in to, to field habitats. Does anybody know? I'm sure people know some, some of those birds. Meadowlark, bluebird. Okay. Well, yeah, to some extent. Uh, usually wet, wet areas. Uh, the, the number of different sparrows. Uh, down here we don't get bobolinks. Do anybody ever see bobolinks? <clears throat> Sorry, I don't have pictures of these, but so, so there's a whole group of birds that will nest in these fields, and these birds are generally western in distribution. In other words, these, these things live out in the prairie. And Pennsylvania doesn't have a lot of open space, and when <clears throat> the state became more agricultural during the 1800s, et cetera, uh, that really, in a sense, provided habitat for some of these birds. And now with the abandonment, abandonment of agriculture, uh, there are getting to be fewer and fewer places left. So when we look at a place like Boyce Mayview, it's big enough that we can say, hey, it, it can be important for, those, for that group of birds, for instance. And so that's what we were kind of going to talk about tonight. But questions about fields, about management in general, we can talk about it. Um, how does that relate to other parts of the park? Anything you guys have questions about? <coughs> what happens if we were to mow this field? What, do, what damage do we do to that field as it, is, as it, as it exists right now? Well, you might not do damage. Uh, it's a different thing, yeah. Okay. Well, one of the things yeah. that I feel like is the most common is bees, butterflies, yeah. um, uh, pollinating insects, and right now there's a, a group of citizens across the, the United States that's concerned about pollinator decline because uh, there's, there's beginning to be a growing body of evidence that uh, bees in particular, but pollinating insects in general, are uh, in decline, and, and, and scientists aren't really sure why. 
but one of the reasons is because of loss of habitat. And um, the kind of habitat that's attractive to pollinators is not what you find on people's lawns. Um, it, that's, that's basically a fairly sterile environment. Um, the kind of forbs and herbs that uh, Jeff was talking about that grow up in a succession in the meadowland area are the areas where pollinating species find protection, they find food, they find a place to lay their eggs and uh, procreate their species. And uh, a lot of people don't know, but three out of every five bites of food that we eat is due to pollination. And without the services of pollinators, we are going to be in, in pretty significant trouble. So it's to our advantage to think about trying to do things that can preserve uh, the pollinating species. And so the fields uh, left in a natural state are, are really a good way to do that. Over time it will, but that kind of time is probably not measured in our lifetime. Yeah. I've got an interest in, two meetings ago Marshall was here and we talked about habitat and we talked about what would be here naturally. Uh, obviously what we have are grown up fields and it's got a mishmash of plants and I'd really be interested in, in somebody's thoughts, I don't know that much about it. I know Jeff knows a little bit more about it. Jeff, um, how, how, what kind of work is entailed in recreating what would be here naturally so that we not just have meadows, but we have natural meadows, not growing up fields and a lot of weeds and stuff? Uh, I mean, I think what you're talking about are sort of non-agricultural grass fields, is what you're talking about. And you know, one, one thing that has, has gotten a lot of emphasis lately are warm season grasses, which are grasses which are actually, for the most part, native to where we are. Most of these grasses that are planted, Tim, Tim, Timothy, for instance, which is a big, uh, that's, that's not native to here. And it's not particularly bad. I mean, it's not invasive necessarily. But it doesn't support things like the native pollinators. Uh, and it, it's not really keyed in to, to the climate where, where we are. Um, but then all the other herbs in the field, you, you can see here, that's most of what you see there is milkweed, just common milkweed. There are a lot of different other herbs that you would find in natural openings. Where do you find natural openings? Well, you don't find a lot. Along rivers where things are scoured. And for the most part, you have almost prairie-like conditions, grasses these forbs that are growing up. So if, if that's what you want to move towards, uh, that's why we're going to have somebody come in and talk about it. But um, you have to ask the question, can you move a field like this into that by the succession and management? Or do you have to literally take it out and replant it? That's another question. So one of the tools that people use is, is um, fire management, burning. Uh, cutting and replanting, uh, depending, you know, this field has, is starting to get um, poison hemlock in it, and the question is, how can you get rid of, and then Canada thistles in here, pretty invasive thing, how do you get rid of it? <coughs> yeah. Marshall mentioned using Roundup and actually taking out a lot of stuff yeah. chemically, is that practical for something as big as what we're talking about? Uh, these aren't really that big. If you have yeah. Volunteers, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, but like the game game commission manages, you know, these huge and, areas. And, yeah. Are there seeds? Where, where can you get seeds to to uh, grow? They're, they're pretty available. A lot of places carry. Yeah. Did, did the what? Did the what? Uh oh, uh, did, did the tower, the, the communications tower, have any effect on wildlife? Um, totally unknown. Uh, the, the one thing with the tower is that was sort of a successional area, and it does take up some space, but as far as the space that went to the tower, it's unlikely they'd had any dramatic effect. Uh, towers have issues with migrating birds and might be some some effect there. No, no way of really knowing. 
Yeah, ma'am. Uh, just looking at a kind of broader perspective, as I say, I'm on the Scott Conservancy Board, also on the Lower Chartier's um, Watershed Council, before I was president of the Mount Lebanon Nature Conservancy, I think I, I like to bring a broader picture because those of us who have worked together, Jeff and Tracy and Jan and Justin over here, I think you've got to realize that we are looking at a broad picture because, you know, Chartier's Creek doesn't know it's going to go from Upper St. Clair to Mount Lebanon to Scott to Crafton or wherever. And we, we do have to work together because it is a broad picture. Um, the air doesn't know it's moving from one place to another, neither does the stream. Um, one thing that concerns me is uh, wildlife corridors. All of us know that if, if, if wildlife is, is, is constricted to one area, they overbreed and they're unhealthy. And so I think if you look at a broader picture, it would be nice for us to get a kind of a corridor in there and certainly voice um, Wingfield Pines into South Fayette and hopefully into Scott and those kinds of things will provide that because I think that's important for all of us to look at a broader picture. And certainly those of you who are going to be more impacted than us should realize that, you know, it's important to have a larger picture of this environment rather than just thinking of Upper St. Clair or Mount Lebanon or Scott. We're in a broad picture. Um, and we should keep that in mind. Yeah, and for, for uh, students here, too, yeah, take advantage. Uh, uh, he pointed out, uh, uh, Regis uh, pointed out that um, because the Laurel Highlands lie, he'd like something around here. Well, there are things around. Uh, there are definitely places to go. And I don't know about you guys, but when, when I was a kid, we wandered through a lot of areas, uh, woodlands uh, around this neck of the woods, and uh, do it. I mean, that that's really, for you to appreciate where you live, you really have to get out and just go visit these areas. You know, it's it's great to go to the Laurel Highlands. It's, it's beautiful, and you get some perspective, but use that perspective to apply here. Go see the places that are close to your, your home. The other thing to remember is that the natural world is really different from the artificial world that we all live in. You know, if you look around this school, the lawns are all manicured. The weeds are all gone out of the lawns because, Scott, you know, uh, True Green or Kim Lawn or somebody comes by and sprays them ever so often to, to keep the weeds down. Nature doesn't like straight lines. Anything that's got weed after the name, it's a good thing in nature usually you know, and a bad thing in your lawn. Um, nature's messy by our standards. It really looks unkempt. There's a purpose for that. That's a natural succession. And it, you know, you need to look at the things that are around you. This park offers a lot of opportunities to do that, to really see what's different from where you live in your house or where you go to school or where you go to, to party versus, you know, the way things are in a, in a more natural setting and to try to understand what those differences are all about because once they're gone, they're gone. And it's very, very difficult to reconstruct those. It's not impossible, but it takes a huge amount of effort. It's one of those things that an ounce of prevention is worth a whole pound and a half of cure. Um, if you do things while you still have something to work with, you can get a lot more um, results for the effort that you put into it than if you're trying to reconstruct something that's already been damaged. And what we have here in Boyce Mayview is something that really has a lot of potential because it's not been damaged so much yet that we can really take it and work with it. Step in and say good night. I know the students have a time frame they needed to work under. Thank you very much for coming. I apologize again, but I'm so glad you came and we were glad. You came.